Hello and welcome. If last month's Crime Watch is anything to go by, the next 40 minutes will lead directly to quick arrests over very serious offences. If you see anything you recognise, the detectives behind me are now waiting for your call. We had 2,000 phone calls and 200 letters. In fact, letters are still coming in on last month's appeal to find the killers of Susan Maxwell and Caroline Hogg. Detective Chief Inspector Stuart Henderson says viewers have given new information for the murder team to work on. So we'll let you know what develops. There's been an arrest following last month's reconstruction of an armed robbery in Southport. A businessman, Peter Joannides, was shot in his own home by two masked raiders and was critically ill. Because of the publicity about Crime Watch, a man came forward with information just before we went on air. Now that, combined with other calls to the studio, led police to a 24-year-old man from Liverpool who's now been charged with aggravated burglary and with attempted murder. Mr Joannides, I'm pleased to say, has now been allowed home from hospital. A wealth of important information came from our reconstruction of a double murder in South Wales. Richard Thomas and his sister Helen were found dead in their burning farmhouse near Milford Haven. Police wanted to trace a man seen in a car outside the house and a fat man who was thought to be Richard's lover. The driver rang the studio and he's now been eliminated from the inquiry. We also had calls from several gay men offering very useful information. If you saw last month's Crime Watch, you'll almost certainly remember this. It was taken by a camera in Barclays Bank in London's Docklands. And although it's such a good photo, amazingly we had very few calls and no one was able to identify him. But some robbery squad officers who were in a pub in Docklands spotted a man they thought resembled him. A man has now been charged with three robberies, conspiracy to rob and firearms offences. This is a letter to thank Crime Watch viewers. It's from the brother of Roy Page. He's the brother of a tobacconist in Bristol who was killed by someone posing as a gas man. A week after our reconstruction, viewers in Portsmouth saw the same man visiting shops in their area and they rang the local police. As a result, Clive Richards, aged 35, from Port Talbot, was arrested. He was found to have a knife and an iron bar in his possession. He's just begun a term of life imprisonment. The letter from Mr Page's brother says, It was only through Crime Watch that the man was ever brought to justice. May I, on behalf of Roy's family, thank you and Crime Watch viewers very sincerely. We start this month's reconstructions with the tragic story of a 15-year-old Dutch girl, Martje Tambosa. Martje had lived in England for the past year. The family moved to Britain because her father was posted here by his company. Their home is at West Horsley, near Guildford in Surrey. The Tambosas have lived here in the village of West Horsley for almost a year. At four o'clock after school on Thursday the 17th of April, Marcia left home to cycle to the next village of East Horsley. The family was out when she set off, but her sister says Marcia wanted to buy some English sweets to take back to the Netherlands on a school trip that weekend. She was a shy girl, but popular and very pretty. This is her 15th birthday party, six days before her death. These are the last pictures her family have of her. Martia passed West Horsley Garage at ten past four. A passerby clearly remembers her blue jacket and her bright turquoise trousers. Martia's mother had told her to keep to the main roads, but there's a well-used shortcut to East Horsley up the cinder path beside the railway. There are no known witnesses from this point on, but someone must have lain in wait. Some ten minutes later, the 4.22 to London passed by, just as a resident, Anthony Mabbott, turned onto the cinder path. The cord was still in place.
he didn't see at the far side of the field, a bicycle. This is an aerial photograph showing the cinder path beside the railway, and this is where the cord was found. Here is Martia's bicycle, and this, an hour later, is where a man was seen behaving rather strangely. He seemed to be peering into the next field, perhaps waiting for some people there to go away. This is where the man was standing. And here, 200 yards away, is Oakwood Close. Just before six o'clock, a man in a dark blue jacket walked into the close from the fields. A resident remembers seeing him pass her house. Just after six, two neighbors driving home into the close also saw a man in blue. They recalled that he had mud on his right shoulder. He was walking in the direction of East Horsley. Five minutes walk away is Horsley Station. Just after six is peak commuter time, and the man would have been walking against the flow of people. By now, the family was deeply worried. It was not like Marcia to stay out without saying where she was. By nightfall, they were frantic. The police had been informed, and friends and neighbors began a search. At half past 10, they found her bicycle. Searchlights were brought in, but by daybreak, Marcia had still not been found. At half past eight, two gamekeepers out shooting met up with the police. Morning, well, we're looking for a missing girl. Have you we've been all through the woods, have you? Yeah, we've been shooting all round here. Yeah. this morning. Yeah. Uh, have you seen anything unusual that you've not seen before? They remembered that they'd seen what looked like green plastic sacks just back there in the woods. They went back with the police and there found Marcia's body. And this is where the body was found. Well, this is the man in charge of the inquiry, Detective Chief Superintendent Vincent McFadden. How did Marty die? Marty died as a result of several blows to the head and she was sexually assaulted. Now, had there been other sex attacks in this area? We would normally expect to find with an investigation like this a number of other incidents which haven't been reported to us. But on this occasion, we found only one incident that we know of, and that took place on the Monday, three days prior to the attack on Marty. This involved a middle-aged woman that was walking from the medical centre towards West Horsley when a man jumped out of the hedge in front of her and did what we must describe as a war dance. The woman retraced her steps. This she, she was unhurt? She was unhurt. This man was described as five foot eight, slim build, collar length, dark hair, two or three days growth of stubble, mid blue anorak and blue trousers. Now, of course, that man might be entirely innocent. He hasn't broken the law. So you obviously want him to ring in if he, if he is innocent. But do you suspect that he might be the murderer? Of course, if, it's, if he is innocent, we would wish to speak to him and would wish for him to contact us. But there is the possibility that he's the same man that was seen in the field. Obviously, if there has been another attack in the area, if any woman has been frightened by a stranger like that, you desperately need them to ring in. Yes, of course. We would ask them to come forward and their calls will be treated with in the strictest confidence. Now, what about the man who one must assume was the murderer who was seen coming out of the fields through Oakwood Close, and we last saw him turning the corner and walking in the direction of East Horsley. Is that the last that we know about him? Yes, he was seen at about two minutes past six in Ockham Road South. Obviously, he could have gone into a nearby house. He could be a local man. But we do have a sighting of a man at a railway station a little later on at seven minutes past six. A man was sitting outside waiting for his wife when this uh, chap described in a blue anorak and blue trousers ran to the booking office door, through a gate because it was locked, up over the bridge. He bumped into a number of people. He's described variously as having a blue anorak or a beige coat on. The train was moving off. He ran towards the train. The, the guard stopped the train and allowed him to get on. That was a good of the guard. Now, what time was that train? Was that, that was fit? Se seven minutes past six. So that would fit precisely. The time that the man would have been walking down that road. OK, so if 
anybody remembers, it was they who got on that train, that 607 train we're talking about, Thursday the 17th of April. That is correct. And they would remember a train yes. stopping for yes. them. Obviously, we would ask him to come forward because it would save us wasting resources if he's just an innocent person running for a train. Some of Marty's belongings were taken. Yes, missing uh, from uh, Marty, in fact, was a purse identical to this. It's Jordache make purse. Inside the purse was approximately £25, a key, and an identical Dutch bank card to this one. This is, in fact, Marty's sister's bank card. Well, there can't be many of those. Now, if, if people ring with suspicions, are you going to be able to check those suspicions out and rule out people who are innocent? Yes, as a result of uh, the latest laser technology, we do have outstanding fingerprints, we have a minority blood group, and we also have forensic evidence, and we will either be able to implicate or eliminate if people will give us details of any suspects. Mr McFadden, thank you very much. If you can help in any way, the number is 01811 Please do ring. You can speak to detectives if you prefer at Surrey Police Headquarters. The number there, 0483 65272. That's 0483, the code for Guildford, 65272. Well, now to this month's incident desk, with news on the search in Hertfordshire for Anne Locke, a raid on a Yorkshire gun shop, a rape in Essex and a double murder in Sussex. Here are Superintendent David Hatcher and Constable Helen Phelps. The search continues tonight for 29-year-old Anne Locke, who disappeared last Sunday. She got married only four weeks ago, and nobody who knows her can think of any reason why she'd leave home. She was last seen at 8.30 on Sunday evening when she left London Weekend Television, where she worked. Her usual journey home to Hertfordshire took her from Waterloo Underground Station on the Baker Loo line to Oxford Circus, then to the Victoria line to Finsbury Park, where she'd catch a British Rail train to Brookmans Park. She probably caught the 9.38 train that evening, arriving at Brookmans Park at one minute past ten. Anne's bicycle, still with the padlock on the back wheel, was found on this footpath. It's about 50 yards away from the station bike shed, where she left it that afternoon. Anne was wearing this ski jacket, but without the sleeves, it was blue on the back. She also had a pink sweater and a black leather bag. If you saw her during her journey home, or if you've seen her anywhere since, please call us. Last month on the incident desk, we asked for information about a rape in which a woman was attacked in her home in Basildon in Essex. One viewer thought he recognised the video fit we showed, and four days later, a 17-year-old youth was arrested and charged with rape. Tonight, Essex police need your help again with another rape in the Basildon area. It happened on Monday the 12th of May in broad daylight, just after midday, in the Trafford House car park in the centre of town. As a woman was parking, she was grabbed from behind, thrown into her car, sexually assaulted and raped. The man was in his early 20s and quite slim. The artist's impression is thought to be an extremely good likeness. He also had a tattoo on his neck, just below the left ear. It was about two inches across and the tattooist who did it may remember the man. The word skins, which is in paler blue, blue ink underneath, was probably self-inflicted. And finally, he was wearing a jumper like this. It had plain red sleeves and the rest was beige with a red fleck. If you think you recognise him, please ring us. Next, a raid on a gun shop in West Yorkshire. The owner and a friend were assaulted and handcuffed at the gunstock shop in Osset near Wakefield. It happened on Thursday the 10th of April and the two raiders stole six 12-bore shotguns, some ammunition and a lethal rifle. It was a Parker Hale hunting rifle, accurate at up to 400 yards. The fear is that it could be used in other crimes. They got away in a black Ford Sierra XR 4x4. It's a rare car, a powerful four-wheel drive and there are only 750 black ones on the road in the UK. One of the men was wearing a green check flat cap. He was dressed for a day's shooting with green wellingtons, light coloured trousers and a green waxed jacket. If you've seen the gun, the car or the man, please call us. It's a month to the day since Peter Thurgood and Lindy Benstead were shot dead. They were found beside an open car in what's been called the Lover's Lane near Rake on the Sussex-Hampshire border. Police still need to hear from anyone who might have seen them on that Tuesday morning. Mr Thurgood left his home in Borden at 10.40 and drove to the old Thorns Golf Club where he picked up Lindy who worked there. Then they drove through Liphook, down the A3 and into Lover's Lane. 
The car was a hired C registration silver Mazda. It's a busy section of the A3, and somebody must have seen it turn across the dual carriageway into the lane. Someone might also remember a red Ford Escort, which was seen driving slowly around the Golf Club car park. A similar car was seen in a lay-by off the A3, not far from Lover's Lane. And a special appeal to a woman who wrote a number of letters to Peter Thurgood. They were posted in Hampshire and signed Kate. It is important that we speak to her. So if you are watching Kate, you can ring us now in complete confidence. And now for something a little different. An improbable scene in this country, you may think. Not so. In recent months, a gang of cattle rustlers has struck at 17 farms throughout East Anglia. We've no evidence they use lassoes, but they do steal valuable cattle trailers or floats, round up cows from neighbouring farms and drive them away. This one, registration XNW 794S, was stolen in March from Stoke Ferry in Norfolk. It was driven to White Plot Farm at Feltwell and loaded with nine Frisians and one Charolais. In April, a 20-foot custom-built maroon and silver float was stolen from Lenwade. The number is FUD 63S. And there's a transfer of Charles and Diana on the front. Later in April, a Volvo B777 RAH was taken from Necton and loaded up with 13 Frisian heifers. The cows have almost certainly been slaughtered, but if you recognise any of the cattle floats or have heard any strange rustlings in the night in your area of East Anglia, call us now. And ring us if you can help with any of our other incident desk cases. The number to remember, if you can help in any way, 01811 8055. That's 01811 8055. Last month, under the title Operation Stranger, police officially linked the murders of two children, six-year-old Barry Lewis and 14-year-old Jason Swift. We showed a reconstruction of the Barry Lewis case four months ago. Tonight, we concentrate on Jason Swift. His body was found only six miles away from Barry's at Stapleford Tawney in Essex. Both boys had been drugged. Very little is known about what Jason did or where he went during the last six months of his life. Some of the people who did see him during that time have taken part in our film to reenact what they remember. We're starting in Hackney in North London, where Jason was living with his sister, Hayley, last July. The flat where Jason stayed with his sister is boarded up now. The family has moved. Jason was brought up in Nuneaton and in East London with his three brothers and sister. When he was six, he was taken into care at a Dr Bernardo's home in Kent and lived there for four years. During that time, Jason got to know the south coast of England well. The children were often taken there on day trips. He went back to live with his mother in 1981, but left there in June last year to stay with his sister Hayley and her husband Adam at their flat in Hackney. Going down the market, Jason, do you want to come? No, I think I'll stay here. Are you sure? Yeah. You know, I'm really happy here. What are you going to be doing while I've gone? I'll just play Monopoly for a while. OK, then. See you later. Right. Bye. Bye. Before he left, Jason stole £75 in cash from his sister's bedroom. He took with him his clothes, a few books and his Monopoly set packed in plastic carrier bags. The door was sort of open, but we thought like, nothing of it. We thought he might have gone into the shops or something and just forgot to shut the door. About 15 minutes later, we noticed the money had gone. And then. We noticed all the insides, the monopoly had gone, all the board and all the money in that had gone. That's when we realised he'd run away. That was on the 6th of July last year. The investigation into Jason's murder spans the six months up to the discovery of his body in November. Around the end of June or beginning of July, he visited a coin dealer in Charing Cross. 
Jason liked to collect foreign coins and had often called before, but this time he'd come to sell. Morning, Jason. Morning, if you got to buy these. Place them on the train. A group like this, I would pay about five pounds for. That's great. Okay. He was a very bright lad, uh, always very polite, very single-minded about his collecting. I suspected, really, that he almost fantasised about going to the countries that the coins originated from and having small change in his pocket to be able to spend if and when he arrived there. We don't know where Jason went immediately after he disappeared, but three days later, on the 9th of July, he turned up on his own at the Silver Sands Caravan Park in Camber Sands, Sussex. Uh, Mrs Clark? Yes? The man on the gate sent me. Yeah? Can I stay in your van? How long for? Just two days. How many of you? Just me. Oh. Oh. Well. Yeah, we'll see what we can do. Come on. Van. Nice, large van. So you're on your own then? Yeah. Don't you ever come out with your parents? No, they let me travel on my own. It's like an adventure. I'm uh, supposed to be visiting a friend in Hastings. Oh, well, that's all in the same area. You're not far from there, you know. No. I thought you would have had a friend with you to company to go about with. A friend? No, well... I had a friend stay with me once, and he stole money from me, so I don't trust anyone. He hadn't been here long when he came back with the key, and he said, I'm going for a swim. So he went for a swim, and when he came back, I suppose it could have been within the hour. I knew he'd been for a swim, because all his hair was all wet. <laughs> and uh, then he went in, in, but I think he might have been down for fish and chips. The next day, he uh, went for a walk to Rye, he said he was going to Rye. I uh, didn't see much of him that day at all. I couldn't make out really how old he was. I thought, you know, 12, because he had two front teeth missing and he seemed such a young child. Very quiet, reserved in his way, I thought. Didn't seem to... Um, well, he wasn't a pushy boy. I rather took to him, really. <laughs> Jason made contact with his family twice at the end of July. On the 22nd of July, he sent a postcard to his mother. The card, now marked by various forensic tests, had been posted on the south coast. Dear Mum, I'm OK and not to worry. I'm working with the fair at South End, so don't worry. See you soon. I'm going to the north soon. Jason Swift. In fact, police now know Jason wasn't with the fair at South End. Around the same time, Haley's husband, Adam, received a phone call. Hello? Uh, hello, Adam. Where are you? I'm staying with a friend from school and his father. Jason, where are you ringing from? I'm in South uh, London. What's the number? I'm, I'm not saying. You coming up? Yeah, I'm thinking of coming back. I don't know when. I'll, I'll phone tomorrow night and tell you. Right. Bye. OK, then, bye. Nothing was heard or seen of Jason at all during August. Then, on the 11th of September, his mother received a birthday card from him. It was probably posted in either Croydon or Crawley. Dear Mum, I haven't forgot you, so don't worry about me. I'm all right. I'll come and see you in the next few months. Happy birthday from Jason. Again, the trail goes cold for the rest of September and the whole of October. Then, on the 6th of November, a girl who knew Jason thinks she saw him on a 253 bus in North London. She travelled from Manor House, but can't remember where Jason got on. When she got off at Mare Street, Hackney, Jason was still on the bus. About three weeks after that, Jason was murdered. He'd been drugged with tranquilizers and asphyxiated. 
Well, Chief, Detective Chief Inspector Derek Cass, there's one very important element in this case which we haven't so far mentioned, isn't there? Yes, there is. He had very few friends of his own age, but he did associate with gay men. Uh, and we're appealing in particular for these persons in the relevant period to come forward and contact us. Are there any particular kinds of people you're appealing to in, the, in that connection? Yes, with the gay connection in mind, um, I would ask the viewers this question. Did a boy of Jason's description visit next door or a house or flat nearby in the months that we are looking to fill? especially the last three weeks in November. If he did, and perhaps he wasn't seen after the last week in November, then I would ask him to come forward, well, these people, the viewers, to come forward and contact us. Right. Now, there are a lot of gaps in that <coughs> calendar of ours. Do you think there are any other people who may have seen him, for example, maybe shopkeepers? Yes, that's right. Uh, Jason is a normal 14-year-old. He would visit shops to purchase sweets, crisps, drinks, uh, and uh, he often did this uh, and shopkeepers, persons visiting shops would probably have seen him. In addition to that, Jason had uh, a bedwetting problem. He also had mouth ulcers and he had his two front teeth missing. Uh, and in connection with that, he may have visited dentists or doctors anywhere uh, to seek consultation. Uh, and we're again asking for the, those professions and their receptionist to contact us and come forward. Right. Obviously, as you said, the last month of his life is very important to find out what he did. Do you think he could perhaps have gone back to the South Coast, which he knew well and loved? Jason had a habit of either going to places he knew or to visit persons he knew. And it's quite likely that he could have visited uh, the South Coast or, for that matter, anywhere. Now, you've linked Jason's death with the murder of Barry Lewis. What are your reasons for doing that? There are several common factors between the two deaths. Firstly, they're both male boys. Secondly, they were both found naked. They were both positioned, uh, Jason at Stapleford Tawney and Barry six miles away at Waltham Abbey, both in rural Essex, both within uh, the borders of North and East London. Right. I'll just make clear again that any gay person who thinks they knew Jason during that time between July and November can come forward in the knowledge that it's in complete confidence and also that no action will be taken against them. Absolutely. Right. So if you do think you can help in any way, please do ring us. Our number here at Crime Watch is 01 8055. Your calls will be treated in complete confidence. Or if you don't want to speak to the police, you can talk to a BBC researcher. Or ring the police direct at Essex headquarters on 0245 267 267. That's 0245 for Chelmsford, 267 267. And now to photo call, television's version of the wanted poster. Five faces tonight, here are Helen Phelps and David Hatcher. First, a building society raider that we're calling the Holloway Heavyweight. He's responsible for seven raids in North London. Here he is on the 1st of April this year, robbing the Leeds Permanent in Blackstock Road. This time he didn't bother to wear a disguise and was on his own. He often works with an accomplice. Look closely at the face and if you recognise him, please give us a call. Now to the northwest, where we think this man and an accomplice have been responsible for a string of attacks on estate agents and building societies. Their trail stretches from Lancashire to West Yorkshire, Greater Manchester and North Wales. In this raid, the man in the bobble hat went behind the counter to collect the cash. This was on January the 24th at the National Provincial in West Houghton, near Bolton. The one in the helmet threatened the cashier with a gun, and as he left, he looked straight into the security camera, giving us this close-up. If you know him or his friend, give us a call. Now on to Huntingdon in Cambridgeshire, where these two men stole a tray of signet rings worth over £11,000 from Stedman's The High Street Jewellers. If you watch closely, you can see the man with the dark curly hair bend over the counter and take a tray of gold rings. He then puts them under his jacket and he and his accomplice walk out. The theft on Friday the 2nd of May wasn't discovered until the shop shut, but someone must recognise them from the video. If you do, ring us. And finally, police at Heathrow need to trace this man, Dennis Martin. There's a warrant out for his arrest after he jumped bail on the 20th of September last year. 
He was due to appear in court on a charge of conspiracy to handle stolen airline tickets. He's fond of staying in hotels, so a special appeal to hoteliers and guest house owners. If you have a man like Dennis Martin staying with you, and bear in mind he's been known to use a different surname, then please call us. So if you recognise him or any of the other people in our photo call, give us a ring. And the number is always 01811 8055. That's 01811 8055. Well, our final reconstruction tonight is the latest in a series of robberies that have taken place in the northwest of England. Two young men attacked a 90 year old man while he was in bed. The man was Sir John Moores, a former chairman of Everton Football Club and a self made multi millionaire. He's the founder and president of the vast Littlewoods Empire. Sir John lives in Formby, near Southport. He's lived in the same house for over 50 years. Sunday afternoon, the 23rd of March, the weekend before Easter. Right now, I just want to undo your buttons and have a listen to your heart. Sir John Moores had been feeling poorly. He'd been visited by the doctor and had spent the day in bed. Downstairs were Sir John's housekeeper, Pat Lewis, and her husband, Alfred. At around four o'clock, a red car was seen driving slowly up and down Charbon Road. The occupants appeared to be looking closely at the houses. Less than a mile away is Freshfield Squirrel Reserve. Sometime that afternoon or evening, a red car was seen there by the warden. It was still there at eight o'clock that night. At 5.30, two men were seen by a neighbour of Sir John's. They were heading from the Squirrel Reserve towards Sir John Moore's house. The police weren't called. By 8 o'clock that night, Sir John Moore's was asleep in bed. Downstairs, Pat and Alfred were watching television. There was an Agatha Christie thriller. Going on. Get down! <gasps> Don't hurt him. Take it easy, there's no need for this. Get down on the floor! Who else is in the house? Only an old man upstairs in bed, John Moores. He's 90. And please don't hurt him, he hasn't been well. Do you own the house? Hey, are you you and Moores? No, we don't own the house. It belongs to John Moores. Right, we'll go upstairs. Please don't hurt him. He'll be all right. Come on, Mr. Moores. Wake up now. Come with me. You'll be all right. Oh, Just be quiet and you won't get hurt. Come on, get, out get, that's get the me lad. Go, will you? Let's go outside. Go. Just take it easy and you'll be all right. Go on, Come on, go on me, will you? Just get keep going quiet with me and you'll be all right. Pat, Pat, there's someone up here. Be Pat. quiet. Go, go. 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 Please, let me go and see to Sir John. Okay, go upstairs. Don't try anything clever. Pat, there's someone up here! Pat, there's someone up here! You won't get hit! Now oh, shut oh, no. up! Please! Pat. We'll give them nothing, Pat! Nothing! Don't hit him! Let oh, me go with him! Leave him alone! Don't hurt him! Don't hurt him! Oh, Pat, if he comes up, get him off me! Just Alfred. shut up, will you, pal? Yes, you don't! Let's, let's hey, all... Keep him back there! Don't let him come any closer! Right, right get down! I'm out of here! An hour went by, and still the ordeal lasted. The robbers had forced Sir John to give them the combination to his safe, but even so, it proved difficult to open. Hey. I bet these are worth a few, Bob. There might be some more in here. How much are you worth, anyway? Millions. I'm a self-made man, and I started with nothing. You ever met the Queen? Yes. I think you're a snob anyway. All you people with money are. You know, I used to work for you once. You didn't pay much, though. Where'd you work? That's enough. You've said too much. I can't get this thing to open. If we don't get any money, it'll be sad. 
Tom, look at these. Yes, we'll have them. How much are they worth? They're valuable. They're antiques. Don't look, do keep quiet, you lot. Give us half an hour, else we'll be back. You can't leave us tied up like this. You can't leave an old man tied up all night. We'll telephone the police or someone. But don't try anything, or we'll be back. Hello, Merseyside Police. Hello, Merseyside Police, can I help you? Um, personal matter. It's a personal matter. Are you sure that it's the police that you want in that case? Yes. Yes. What's the problem, please? Well, there's been a, an accident, you see. An accident? What kind of an accident? A break-in. Oh, it's a burglary you're reporting? Yeah. I see. And what's the address, please? Formby. Formby? What's the address in Formby? I, I don't know the address. It's just on um, a, a famous person's house, Sir John Moore. Sir John Moore's house? And he's been tied up. What, Sir John Moore's been tied up? Yeah. Yes. By burglars. Yes. But how have you come by this information? Hello? Chief Inspector Bob Cody took charge of that investigation. Firstly, what happened to the three victims? Are they OK? The f physically, they're quite all right now. Obviously, it was a terrifying experience, and it'll take a while for the mental scars to go away, but physically, they're fine now. What did the two robbers eventually steal? They eventually stole a set of gold and diamond cufflinks, a small amount of cash, and a pair of double barrel shotguns, similar to this one here. Now, tell us about these guns. There's a label on the side. Yes, they're William, Barrel, uh, William Powell double barrel shotguns, side lock ejectors, um, very distinctive, very valuable guns. And they have serial numbers on they them? They have serial numbers on the guns. The serial numbers are 12508 and 12509. Now, any reputable gunsmith would obviously see those. There's a reward on this case. Yes, there's a reward of £5,000 to anyone who gives information leading to the arrest and conviction of these people. Now, how would one know them? What clues are there? Well, we hope that someone will be able to recognise the voice of the, pe the person that telephoned and perhaps couple that with a vehicle which was seen near to the scene and which we believe they escaped in. Now, how did they get away? They got away in the housekeeper's maestro motor car. They went to the nearby uh, Squirrel Reserve and we believe they escaped from there in a red Ford Escort car, uh, uh, similar to the one to, seen. You want to connect anybody with access to a car like that with the voice. Let's hear that voice again. It's, it's quite clearly a Liverpool accent. Hello, Merseyside Police. Um, it's a personal matter. Can you tell me what it is? Well, there's been a, an accident, you see, a break-in. Can you give me the address? I, I don't know the address. It's just on um, a famous person's house, Sir John Moore, and he's been tied up by burglars. The victims weren't actually struck, physically assaulted this time, but is this a one-off crime? No, it's not a one-off crime. This is one of a series of offences in Lancashire and Merseyside, and I've no doubt that unless these people are caught very quickly, someone will become seriously hurt. Well, Mr Cody, let's hope someone will ring in. Please do if you can. Call us on 018118055, or you can call Merseyside Police Direct. The number there, 051 777 4944. 051, that's if you're outside Liverpool, Double seven seven four nine double four. Please do keep trying if the lines are busy, but if you can't get through in the end, you can write to us at this address. Crime Watch UK, BBC TV, London W12 8QT. Or you can contact your local police. Every force in the country is notified of the cases we cover. And CFAX, of course, has details and phone numbers on page 186. I'm sorry we're so late tonight, but if you can stay out, we'll be back to tell you what happened. That's at Crime Watch Update at 11.40. And one important message before we go, we appealed on incident desk to Kate, who had written letters to Peter Thurgood, who was murdered in Lover's Lane in Rake. Now, Kate has rung. Kate, you asked to speak to a woman, and we didn't have a woman available at the time. We've managed to get a woman to the phone, but you'd rung off by then. Please ring again. We do have a woman waiting to speak to you now. And that's it from us for the moment. We're taking a break next month, but we'll be back in July and at our normal time. Don't have nightmares, please. Sleep well. Good night. Good night.